from just outside our nation's capital, from Abiding Life Grace and Faith Center in Alexandria, Virginia, this is Rivers of Living Water. I'm Ken Miller. Join us any Sunday morning at 11 o'clock or Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Our meeting location is 1001 Queen Street, Alexandria, Virginia. The mailing address is Post Office Box 772, Annandale, Virginia, 15003. Amen. Okay. Second Corinthians 8 9 says, For by the grace, for you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. How many of you believe that? Heavenly Father, we just submit, I just want to submit myself into your hands. I submit this sermon into your hands. I submit all of us <laughs> into your hands, Lord, and I ask you, Lord, to have your way with your church. Let me say only that which you intend for me to say. Let me speak nothing of the flesh, nothing of my own mind, but let me speak by your spirit. Let me speak according to your word. Let me speak according to that which you intend for your people to hear. I yield to you spirit, soul, and body, mind, heart, and tongue, totally and completely yielded to you, Lord Jesus. Have your way this morning. Have your way, and I invite you to confirm your word with signs following, according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. All right. Well, let me, I want to begin by asking you a question. You know, we've been talking about scriptural prosperity for, this is actually the sixth message along the lines of scriptural prosperity. But to begin with, I want, I, I've entitled this sermon, The Number One Key to Scriptural Prosperity. So I just want to ask you. What do you think the number one key is? The number one key. You might say, well, I believe that stuff, but for some reason it doesn't work for me. Well, what do you think the number one key? It might, it, <laughs> it might surprise you. I don't know. Maybe it won't. But what is the number one key for scriptural prosperity? Any ideas? Give. Okay, one person says give. I'll actually probably be talking about that next, next time. Well, within the next... Within the next month, anyway, <laughs> I plan on doing a sermon uh, about uh, clarifying what tithing is all about and sowing and, and things like that. What, what's your thought on that? Uh huh. Hearing. I heard somebody say hearing and hearing. Was that you or was that Alex? I heard somebody say hearing and hearing. So. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. All right. What you said first was actually what I was getting at, believing. I, I would say the number one key to prosperity, the number one key for receiving anything from God is just simply believe it. Believe that it's true. And I think that, you know, what, what does James say? James says, don't be double-minded. When you ask, ask in faith, not wavering, because if you're wavering, if you're double-minded, he says, don't let that man think he'll receive anything. So double-minded is like when you believe, but then you start doubting and you think, well, maybe not. And then you believe and then you don't believe. You know, there, there's a lot of double-mindedness in, in the world. And it's easy to be double-minded, so I'm not being critical of, <laughs> of that per se, because when you're around other faith people, it's easy to say, I believe and be strong in faith. But then... The next day when you're confronted with the realities of the world, it's easy to start doubting. <laughs> so, so when we're flipping back and forth between faith and unbelief, that's being double-minded, and I think that's a big hindrance. I think the number one key to receiving anything from God is just simply believe it. What does it say in Hebrews 11:6? You all know that. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. He that comes to God must do what? Two things. You must be first believe that he is have faith that he is. Secondly, believe that he's a rewarder. <laughs> he wants to reward you. He wants to bless you. So first of all, you must believe. You must have faith. The word believe means to have faith. You must have faith. You must believe that God is who he says he is, and he wants to do what he says he, he'll do. Because there's so many promises, and we've, over the past several weeks, we've looked at a lot of promises for prosperity, but it's easy to think, yeah, I know God said that, but the same way with healing. You know, I've heard this many times over the years. I know the Bible says that, but, you know, you've got to deal with reality the way it is. Or, you know, we've got to be real. We've got to live in the real world, <laughs> as, as one person used to tell me all the time. 
Okay, well, God's word is the real word, is the real world as far as I'm concerned. If God says it, I believe it, and that settles it, okay? Hebrews 4.2 says, For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. So if the word of God doesn't seem to be working for you, maybe you don't really believe it. <laughs> or or it, maybe you do believe it, but maybe there there is an issue of double-mindedness. And this isn't to put condemnation on anybody. I certainly don't intend it to, for that. This is to be a message of encouragement, to encourage you, just simply believe what God said. Just simply believe it. Too often we, we I think we, we need to have an, a, a confident expectation of good. God wants to bless you, and we need to get to know the character of God fully and completely, that God wants to bless you, have a confident expectation of good things. Too often I think we are expecting wrong things, or we are expecting the status quo, <laughs> But God loves you. God is for you. He wants to bless you. He wants to promote you. The real question is, do you believe that? <laughs> do you really believe that? You know, there are, there are a lot of scriptures like this. Let me, I shared a few, uh, several months ago, a few months ago anyway. Yeah, it was probably last fall. I shared several scriptures which I referred to at the time as God's blank check. These scriptures just seem too good to be true. It's almost like God gave you a blank check. He signed it and said, fill it in for whatever you want. I mean, th these scriptures are that good. <laughs> and, you know, and he says, God is not a man that he would lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he not said and will he not do it? Has he not spoken and will he not make it good? And I want to share this scripture with you to, to reaffirm in your mind that if it's in God's word, you can believe it and you can act upon it. Don't doubt it. <laughs> believe that he means what he says. He's not a man that he should lie. If you find a promise in God's word, and Paul told the Corinthians, all the promises are yes and no, right? Amen. Yep. Amen. <laughs> yes and amen. <laughs> They're not yes and no. They are yes and amen. All right? So he's not a man that he should lie. If you find a promise in God's word, claim it, and God's going to say yes. And then you say, amen, your way of, of saying, so be it. I agree with it. He tells us in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. This is one of those scriptures where he tells you just simply ask. God wants to answer your prayer. God wants to give you blessing. He wants to do good things for you. We know that because just a few verses later in verse 11, he says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts, to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So God is a loving Heavenly Father. And just like you want to bless your children, God wants to bless you. God wants to, to do good things for you. He's not withholding things from you. Now, here, here's an awesome, this is one of those blank check scriptures. Jesus says, whatever, in John 14, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now he says that in verse 13, and if you didn't catch it, he repeats basically the same thing in verse 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Anything in his name. So he put his signature on it, his name, and he's saying anything. Throw it out. And again, this is one of those scriptures that if, if, if this promise, a promise like this occurred only one time, it'd be easy to dismiss it. We could easily explain it away. We could say, well, what he really means is, and then come up with our excuse why it really doesn't mean what it says. If it was just occurred once, maybe we could do that. But it, in the very next chapter, he says basically the same thing twice. In verse 7, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. Not just what God desires for you, but he says what you desire. Now, the key is, as we spend time abiding in him, we'll find ourselves desiring the same things he desires. But you can ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. Skipping down just a few verses to verse 16, he repeats the same idea. 
You did not cho choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. What a tremendous promise. What a tremendous God. What tremendous radical love he has for his children. And, okay, so that was two references in chapter 14, two references in chapter 15. There's two more references in chapter 16 saying the same thing. In verse 23, he says, In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Verse 24, Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, you will receive, that your joy may be full. Okay, so twice in chapter 14, twice in chapter 15, twice in chapter 16, he gives a promise saying, just simply ask. Just simply ask. God wants to answer your prayers. He wants to give generously unto, unto his people. And, you know, and, and again, I keep coming back to why aren't more people experiencing this? And I would say the biggest reason is they aren't fully persuaded. They don't fully believe it. And, you know, you, you, you kind of are entertained with the idea of, well, could that really mean what, he, could he really be meaning what he's saying there? There's got to be a catch. There's got to be something else. And the something else, some people will say, uh, like a couple of answers I've heard here, giving or tithing, but the, the promise of prosperity is not based upon that. The promise of prosperity is based upon the blood of Jesus. The promise of prosperity is the same as the promise of righteousness, the same as the promise of healing. It's not based upon what you do, it's based upon what Jesus did. Jesus did everything that needed to be done for you to be righteous, right? You don't have to do anything to be righteous, just simply believe what Jesus did. And you don't have to do anything to receive your healing. Just believe that what Jesus did, those stripes upon his back, were sufficient for your healing. And you don't have to do, I really believe this, and I'll explain it more in more detail in my next sermon, probably, unless the Lord leads in a different direction. You don't have to do anything to receive his abundance. Jesus did everything that needed to be done. He took your poverty upon himself, just like he took your sin upon himself, and he took his si your sickness upon himself, he took your poverty upon himself, and in exchange he gives you righteousness, he gives you healing, he gives you prosperity, he gives you abundance. So the, the, uh, in, in Romans chapter 4 it says, the promise that, that, that he, this is referring to Abraham, that he would be heir of the world, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, in other words, through works, through do's and don'ts, but through the righteousness of faith, okay? So because, in other words, because Abraham believed God and that faith was counted unto him for righteousness, along with that righteousness came all the other blessings of the covenant. If you really believe that you are righteous, and this I think is a key, what, in believing God for any of the blessings, believe that you are righteous. Now, it's easy to say that, especially in a, in a, uh, a what, what you might call a religious setting or a spiritual setting, a Christian setting around other believers. It's easy to say this, but do you really believe that you're righteous? All your sins, past, present, and future have been nailed to the cross. And when you stand before God, God does not see those sins of your past or your future. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. Now, I'm going to say something, this may sound too radical, and it may sound blasphemous, but, don't, but hear me out. I think I'll convince you. I'm reluctant to say it because at the beginning it's going to sound like blasphemy. I'm as righteous as God is. You are as righteous as God is. Now, how can you say that? He imputes his righteousness into you. So how, what else does it mean that he has given you the gift of his righteousness? He has given you his righteousness within you, upon you. So when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. Okay? You are as righteous as Jesus. Not, by, not based upon your works. Not based upon anything you did or didn't do. But your righteousness is based upon the righteousness of Jesus. Okay? So if you really understand, if you really understand this, when you, when you ask God the Father for anything in the name of Jesus, it's as if Jesus himself is asking. 
When God looks at you and you're asking, Father, heal this person in the name of Jesus, or Father, take care of this debt in the name of Jesus. When you use the name of Jesus with authority, it's as if Jesus himself is making that request. And if, if Jesus were making that request, do you really think God would say no? When you're saying it, standing in his righteousness, standing in using his name, God is not going to say no. Because it's all about Jesus. <laughs> all right, so I hope you hear what I'm saying with this. That, that the, the Abraham, the promise that he would be heir, that means receiving all the blessings, was not based upon the law, but because of righteousness through faith. Abraham was righteous in God's eyes because of his faith. Okay. Now, if you look at Abraham's life, you can see all kinds of mistakes, and we've talked about that in the past. You know, we, you might, it's, it's just like you look at David's life and you see, all the mistakes he made, and God calls him a man after my own heart. And you, you read through his, his life and you think, how could God say that about him? And how could God say that about Abraham when he clearly slipped out of faith from time to time? <laughs> you know, he, he's supposed to be the father of, of faith, and yet he has this affair with, with Hagar and he, that his wife approved of, <laughs> or even suggested. Uh, he, he lies twice about his wife, you know, saying she's my sister because he was afraid of what might happen to him. You know, he slipped out of faith quite a bit, but yet God calls him the father of faith. Okay? But his righteousness was because of faith. God did not look at his mistakes. God looked at, at righteousness through faith. And I already pointed out this scripture that all your poverty was placed upon Jesus, and he gives you all his abundant wealth. He gives you all his riches because of what he did on the cross. It's not... You know, don't don't look at, you know, because I know if you watch a lot of these telethons on TV, they're you know they they sometimes persuade you that if you if you want to break through in your finances, you've got to write that check for a thousand dollars and send it in to them, and you know, and I'm not telling you not to if God tells you to do that, but don't don't feel pressured because of a high pitched sales <laughs> salesman. <laughs> in the form of a preacher on television, but you're, the, the abundance that God wants to give you is not based upon anything except for the work of the cross. Now, if, if you really believe this, if you really hear what I'm saying, it's, you know, because people say, well, you mean you don't want people to give? Of course I want people to give. But <laughs> this message should be liberating, if anything, that God has already blessed you. Don't base your, your status as righteous based upon whether or not you feel righteous, because you may not always feel righteous, all right? But you're still righteous. And, and in the area of healing, I may not always feel healed, but I believe God's word above my circumstances. I believe God's word above what my body tells me. And God's, God's word, if it tells me I'm healed, and it does, I check it frequently, it still says the same thing. It hasn't changed. <laughs> He still says I'm healed, so it doesn't matter what I feel like or what the doctor may say. My health is not based upon any of that. My health is based upon what God's word says. Prosperity is the same way. You know, I can look at my bank account. I can look at my circumstances, and I can very easily, if I allow myself to, I could very easily get discouraged. But my faith, my prosperity is not based upon what my bank account says. My prosperity is not based upon what my paycheck says or my wallet says or anything like that my prosperity is based upon what God's word says and God's word says that he is my abundant supply Amen. and he is my supply he is my source he is my wealth and remember Joseph when he had nothing in the midst of his slavery God said he was prosperous God was with him and he was prosperous so if Jesus is with you you are prosperous praise God again it's not based upon anything except for what Jesus did on the cross faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, the NIV says, hearing the message through the word about Christ. I notice that a lot of a lot of translations use the word Christ and others use the word God. I don't know why there is a dispute over whether it should be word of God or word of Christ, but there's a, about half the translations I looked at says word of God and the other half say word of Christ. But this is a key, and I want to spend a few minutes on this because I think this really is a key that... You know, you, you don't have to do anything 
But scriptural prosperity, I believe, should be effortless, just like all the blessings of God should be effortless. You don't have to do anything. He did all the doing on your behalf. So getting in touch with who you really are in Christ, I think, is a key. And what you already have in him, you know, it's all by faith. If, uh, if, if, you, if you really believe what God's word says, you'll be at peace about your situation. No matter how disturbing it may look, you'll be at peace, you'll be at rest if you really believe what God's word says. So faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. Okay, faith is the number one key. I really believe this. And, and if, you, if you say, well, it's just not working for me, well, I would say, well, just keep on hearing and keep on hearing and keep on hearing. If it's a health issue that you're facing, keep on hearing messages and, and sermons and scripture on the area of healing. If it's, if it's a, a financial issue, keep hearing messages on prosperity, on the promises of prosperity. The, the problem, again, I think, and I'll touch more on this in my next sermon, but one problem with a lot of the prosperity sermons is that they push the burden back on you, <laughs> saying you just need to give more. And I, I don't think that's, that's the solution. I think it's faith is the number one key. Just like all the other promises of God, the number one key is you need to be fully persuaded. So keep on believing, keep on believing, keep on hearing. I, I've talked about this in the past, but I want to emphasize it again because I think this is where faith begins. If you feel like, well, I think I have faith, I'm trying to have faith, well, stop trying to have faith and just simply rest in the promises of God and keep hearing the, the word of God. In Exodus 15, 26, it says, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, and that's the scripture that goes on to talk about Jehovah Rapha, and I want to share with you briefly the Hebrew word Shema. Have any of you heard me teach on this or anyone teach on this? The Hebrew word for hearing is Shema. And frequently in the Old Testament, just like in, in Romans, in, just like in Romans 10, 17, it, so, it talks about hearing and hearing. Repetitious hearing, just keep hearing. It's, faith doesn't come from having heard the word of God. Faith comes from hearing and hearing and re repetitious hearing. Keep hearing. Well, the Hebrew word for hearing is Shema, and this word heed here is Shema. The word diligently is also the word Shema. So what it really says in the Hebrew, word, Hebrew is, if you Shema, Shema. If you hear and keep hearing the word of the Lord, in the, well, in that scripture it produces health. And in Deuteronomy 11, it's translated earnestly obey. But again, it's Shema, Shema. You can look it up on your own if you wish. I don't know why it's translated different ways in different places, but here again he's saying, if you Shema, Shema, my commandments. And if I remember correctly, the context there is for blessings for your family. And then in Deuteronomy 28, if you Shema, Shema, it says diligently obey in this New King James Version, but it's saying Shema, Shema, hearing, hearing the voice of the Lord, and then it goes on to talk, you know, Deuteronomy 28, it talks about all kinds of blessings that will come upon you. If you, see, we look at that in English and we say, well, I'm just not being obedient enough. But that's not really what it says in the Hebrew. It says, if you listen, listen. If you listen and keep listening, hearing and hearing, Shema, Shema, the word of God, or the voice of the Lord. Listen and keep listening. Hear and keep hearing. And this idea is seen in 1 Kings 3. What was the prayer Solomon prayed? <clears throat> you know, we, we believe that he, uh, in, in King James or New King James, in most translations, it, it, we, we say, well, he asked for wisdom. But what he asked for is an understanding heart. But what do you think that word understanding is? It's the Hebrew word Shema. So what he's really saying is, give to your servant a hearing heart to judge your people. So he understood the need to hear from God. The, you know, I, I can't rule your people unless I can hear you, Lord. Okay. All right. And in Luke chapter 5, verse 15, and this is one example out of many where it says that they came to hear and to be healed. They came to hear and to be healed. Now, 
if you need a healing, of course, God can minister healing to you at any time. But, you know, one of the purposes of the healing services is so that people can hear what God's word says about healing and then, and then receive it. You know, sometimes people just want a quick fix. They want a gift of healing or a working of miracles or something like that. And that's fine. That's great when those things happen. But you can receive healing just simply through faith, just simply through believing that God means what he says. So one of the purposes of the, the primary purpose of the healing service is to convince people, to teach people that God wants to heal them. And God equally, equally wants to bless you with provision, with prosperity, with blessing, with scriptural prosperity. Isaiah 55, this, this is a, an interesting scripture. Why do you spend money on what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully. And again, I underlined it. Listen is Shema. Carefully is also Shema. Shema, Shema to God and eat what is good. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. And then he, he says, incline your ear. So that, it's a different Hebrew word, but again, he's saying, listen, basically is what he's saying there. Incline your ear, listen to me. And come to me here, and that is the Hebrew word Shema, and your soul will live. And I'll make an everlasting covenant with you and the sure mercies of David. So again, there's four emphases of, on listening here in this scripture. So I think listening is a key. So get your iPods <laughs> or your CD players or whatever, load it up with the word of God and just constantly listening. And, and you know, we, I think this should be a higher priority. And, and for the people that are here, maybe this is already, already is a very high priority. But I, I find, you know, I'm part of my life is there's a political side of me where I like to hear the news and I like to get it, hear about politics and things like that, but I'm getting less and less of that because most, most of that is kind of irrelevant anyway. And we need to, you know, whatever spare time that you have, just fill it up with the Word of God, listening and listening and listening, especially if you have a need in any area of your life, whether it's healing or prosperity or family issues or whatever it is, just keep hearing the word of God on that subject. Faith, this is where faith begins, hearing and hearing and hearing. This is how faith is developed, hearing, hearing, and hearing. Just, just briefly, I put this up here, but there are seven faith facts if you want to encourage yourself in faith. Let me, I'll just go through these very briefly. These are seven faith facts that I taught on last summer or last fall. Uh, first of all, that faith comes by hearing and hearing. Secondly, faith is built up by speaking in tongues. So if you want to build up your faith, speak in tongues a lot. That's Jude 20. Uh, faith works by love, but a lot of, I think a lot of times, and that's Galatians 5, 6, I think a lot of times people get the idea that that means I've got to love more, but I think what it really means is God's love for us. Faith, faith works when we get a true revelation of how much God loves us. When we really comprehend God is radically in love with you. It's easy to have faith in a God like that. He's not a God that's, that's hovering over you, ready to clobber you as soon as you do something wrong. He's radically in love with you. He wants to bless you, and he wants that love to reflect through you to other people. 2 Corinthians 4.18 talks about faith, the seeing of faith. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then a few verses later, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith and not by sight. So faith sees the truth of God's word. Fifth, faith speaks in agreement with God. There's numerous scriptures that we've looked at over the, over the months that talk about the importance of speaking in agreement with God's word. If God says I'm healed, I'm not going to say I'm sick no matter what I feel like, no matter what the doctors say. If God says I'm prosperous, I'm not going to say I'm poor. <laughs> I'm not, and, and one thing I've told you before, I will not say I can't afford it. I will not allow those words to come out of my mouth. So if you hear those words come out of my mouth, just slap me, okay? <laughs> but to say I can't afford it is not recognizing the bigness of God, all right? So we need to understand God is, God can do much more than we 
give him credit for sometimes. So speak in agreement with God's word concerning finances and concerning everything else. Romans 4.21 tells us that Abraham was fully persuaded, and that's in the context of, of faith. Faith is fully persuaded. No, no more double-mindedness. Okay? If you, if you feel double-mindedness sneaking in, go back to hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word of faith. All right? And, and in James chapter 2, it says faith without works is dead. Basically, that, what that's saying is actions will reflect what you really believe. If you really believe it, you'll act like it, all right? Going back to uh, Hebrews 4.2, and I think I'll close with this. For unto us the gospel was preached, as well as to them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So the number one key for prosperity, I, fully, I firmly believe, there are, there are other things, again, we'll talk about the issue of giving and tithing and sowing and reaping and all that, that's, that's another sermon for another time, probably two weeks from today. I believe Valerie has the message next week, right? So, so two weeks from today, I'll give another sermon. I'll continue along the lines of scriptural prosperity, and I'll probably at that point get into what the Bible teaches about tithing and sowing and reaping and things like that. But, the, but put that out of your mind for now, and just remember the number one key is you need to really believe it. Do you really believe that God wants to prosper you? God says it's already done. <laughs> he, he took the stripes upon, he took your sickness so that you'd be healed and you are healed according to God's word. He took your poverty and he's made you prosperous. You are prosperous. Even if you don't have anything else to your name, you don't own anything on earth. If you have Jesus, you're rich. Okay? That, 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 that guy that could feed 15,000 people with just a, one boy's sack lunch and then have 12 baskets full left over, he's living on the inside of you, so that makes you prosperous. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to finish with one more song, Amen. and uh, it's called With His Love.
So he says, when I'm under the law or under the commandment, then I find sin revives in me and that which I don't want to do. In other words, you don't want to do it, but you do it anyway. And that's what Paul says. I don't want to sin, but the sin I don't want to do. So in other words, Paul is kicking, screaming, I don't want to do this, but he's doing it. And all his willpower and every effort and every scripture he quotes and all the holiness he knows by the law doesn't possess the power to keep him out of sinning. And that Paul defines as condemnation. Condemnation is not an emotion of guilt. That's why we've got the word guilt. Condemnation means to have a sentence over you where, wherein you are condemned unto a certain way of living. But Christ came and ended that contract that man had with death. So that we might be married to someone new. And we've had this thing that it is so difficult to live right. And we must just try to live right. But I want to tell you there's a place that Jesus Christ brought to us where that is effortless. And we don't sit with a God in heaven that looks at man and says to man, Listen, I am your God, you are my people, and here is my ten laws, do them. And if you do them, then I'll bless you. If you don't do them, I will curse you. That's not what God has done. God was a father, and he brought forth children. And then he saw his children partook of a tree that kills them. The tree that, the, the, Jesus, God didn't say, if you partake of this tree, I'll kill you. No, no, no. He says, you portray of, of this tree, this tree will kill you. And then he saw man eat something that poisoned him unto sin and death. And then like a father that loves his child that's kidnapped, or that loves a child that went against the will of the father and drank some poison, if he drinks, what will happen? He'll die. It's like gasoline. If he drinks it, gets into his lungs, what's going to happen? He's going to die. If you tell your child, don't drink it, and he does, and he's busy dying, what do you do then? Beat him? Punish him because of his disobedience? Or do you give your life to save him? Because he is your child that's got a poison in him that is killing him. And you want to redeem him. You want to have him back. Okay? So Jesus Christ, God in Christ did exactly that. And this is what, when it comes to this simplicity, Paul says, I will, I will connect you to Christ. And when I connect you to relationship, will bring forth certain fruit in you. And let's read the, the, the fruit that it will bring forth. It says, the husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to the church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. This is the message translation. So, Paul says, listen, the safest place for you is if I can connect you with someone that will lead you without domin domineering you. Or, or is it dominate? It's not the English word. Without forcing you. Without being a boss over you. But someone that will cherish you. So here the Apostle Paul comes and he says, the safest place for man. He, he, he likens this to a to a father with his daughter and a husband. He says, I love you people in Corinth like I would love my own daughter. That's the kind of, that's the analogy he uses. And he says, the best thing I could ever do, the place where I know you will be the safest, is by me giving you to Jesus. And he gave us, he gave the church in Corinth to Jesus because he, was, he knew this, this, this dynamic. And the dynamic there is that they will have that they will meet someone that will cherish them. That will cherish them. And when we preach the gospel, when you read the Bible, church, you need to read the Bible from the perspective of a husband that loves his wife and cherishes his wife. We many times want to have the analogy with a father and a small child. But when it comes to, yes, there's a lot of family-related things in the Bible. One of the most powerful is marriage. Marriage. I cannot boss my wife around. I cannot do it. And the guy who says he can, he's lying. 
He'll have trouble when he gets home. In the very same way, you know, if, if you think of a husband that loves his wife with everything in him, that is God towards you and times it with a billion. So just as the church submits to Christ, as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Husband, go all out in your love for your wives. Now listen, hear this. Exactly as Christ did for the church, a love marked by giving and not getting. So what was Paul thinking? Now remember, we, talk, we, we, we are laying the foundation of just explaining the simplicity of the gospel. Paul comes and he says, listen, I give you to Jesus. I introduce you to the gospel. I introduce you to the simplicity of the gospel, which I will explain. In this simplicity, you will find that there is this Jesus guy will cherish you. And the safest place where people can ever be is in an atmosphere of being cherished by the Almighty. To be in the presence of a God that is not, whose love is not marked by getting, but by giving. How many times when we go to church, we say, God, whatever you want of me, I'll give it to you. Lord, ask anything, especially now, at the end of worship. Then we feel, man, I've, I've, I've now worshipped myself in. <laughs> to a greater commitment. Isn't it? Yeah. And then you say, Lord, whatever you ask, I'll do. Now, I don't say we cannot have a place where you say, Lord, whatever you would want of me, I will do on account of him first loving you. But in my experience and in the 20 years that I had to do or 30 years that I had to do with church, I found that the basic attitude is, you know, God wants something from me. He wants something from me. And the love of God is earmarked by him wanting something. He'll do something, but he wants something. It's not just he loves you. That's it. I'm not saying we cannot give our life to Jesus. I'm not saying that we cannot believe in him. I'm not saying we can give ourselves over to him. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about... The relationship you have with God. What do you think? Is, is the love that you think of God marked by what He can give you or what He can get from you? Especially in the area of finances. When you go to church, it's the attitude, you know, what does God want from me? Or what can God, or what is God already giving to me? Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Is the idea we have of God one that is a servant? That is not just a servant when he was on earth, but that he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Okay. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evokes her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, Dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. Do you see how Paul would present the church as holy and blameless in the return of the Lord? It's by connecting the people with the true gospel, with Jesus. For Jesus is the one that will cherish them. Jesus is the one that will love them. Jesus is the one that will bring them to an atmosphere where they know this, this God that I've got to do with is not the one that sees what he can get from me, but one that wants to show me what he can, that wants to give towards me. And what will all that do? What will all those things do? It will evoke the beauty that's already in us. So, when we connect this, this passage with Corinthians, you will see that there is already a beauty inside the church, or inside the Corinthians. When the Bible says God so loved the world, He didn't love the world for no reason. The word love talks about an excitement of the mind on account of beauty you behold. I love my wife. Why? Because of who she is. My goodness. No, just for no reason. 
I just love her because I'm love. No, no, no. I love her because of the personality she has. I love her because of how beautiful she is. I love her for who she is. That's what the word love means. We've, we've had this thing about love, you know. God loved a lesser being than himself. I imagine I come and I say to you, I'm in love with my dog. You'll say there's something wrong with this guy. I mean, there is some psychological well, names or stuff for that. You know, it's, it, there's, a pro there's a problem with this guy. He's in love with an animal. But we say God, you know, just loves us that cannot be loved. There's no reason why he loves us. No, no, no. There's something God saw in the world. There's a beauty inside the world. I see it myself. The other day we were at a restaurant. There was a Chinese lady there. I don't know if she knows the Lord or is a believer or not or whatever. I don't know even what country she is. But when I looked at her, I could see the beauty of God inside her. And I could enjoy that. You know? If I look at you guys walking in here, I, not just because you're a Christian, but because of design, because of, we are the only being in existence that have our image and our likeness like that of God. It's us. So when God sees his own kind, don't you think he will love his own kind? And then he gave Jesus and he brought a truth in Christ that man can be connected with somebody that's not a taskmaster, but somebody that will uh, um, cherish and not dominate, but cherish and have words of kindness. That will do what? That will bring forth the beauty. We think, you know, once you get saved, you become, you become beautiful. No. God's, God gave His Son for people that are in His image and in His likeness. When, I'm not saying everybody is saved. Please, I don't believe, I'm not a universalist. Okay? Hear, hear that. I'm not a universalist. I don't believe in universalism. Doctor. Next slide. I hope you guys are not in a hurry. Okay. <laughs> but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity in Christ. Simplicity, sing, uh, um, singleness, simplicity, sincerity, mental honesty, the virtue of one who is free from pretense and hypocrisy, not self-seeking, openness of heart manifesting itself by generosity. I've just taken the Greek word right there. I didn't add anything, didn't take anything away. It's, this is the meaning of some, the, the, the simplicity that is in Christ. So what is in Christ? Singleness, and, and that singleness I'm going to explain to you now. Sincerity, the virtue um, of one who is free from pretense and hypocrisy. You know what that means? It means that God will never tell you to do something he will not do himself. Okay? He will first love you. Not self-seeking. Not self-seeking. Because I am scared that your minds will be corrupted by the Satan, or by Satan, how? From the not self-seeking that is in Christ. So what do we see in Jesus? We need to see in Jesus one that is not self-seeking. He's not in the thing for himself. He's in it for you. Amen. Openness of heart manifesting itself by generosity. <laughs> so what we need to have, when we, when we think of Christ, we need to think of somebody who's got an open heart. And it's not just an open heart, but an open heart that doesn't need you to do anything to, so that he can do something for you, but an open heart already manifesting in generosity. That's a simplicity that's in Christ. And I tell you, church, what Satan came to do is he came to deceive man from that simplicity. 
Next one, please. Okay. That word simplicity comes from a root word, pleco, which means twine or to braid, to plait. It's the same word where the Bible says here um, in Matthew 6 22, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. That word single there comes from this root word, which means to braid or to plait, which it's got the same root word as the word simplicity or singleness. So, when the Bible says, if your eye is single or simple, your whole body will be full of light. What he's saying is, if your eye is an eye which sees something folded together or plated or braided, your whole body Will be full of light now what is the you know if you go and there you can see some beautiful braidings you cannot braid without at least three strands it's impossible you need three you can't do it with one or two you need three so here what he says is i am so scared that you will be deceived by the devil from this simplicity that is in Christ. What is the simplicity? It's this not self-seeking. This, this being that is in it for you. And if we look at this simplicity, you must acknowledge that this simplicity in Christ had to exist even before time. It couldn't just have started with man. And what is this original braiding. Let's go to the next passage. The next slide there. The Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now this, this picture was painted in the 1400s by a Russian artist and that is the picture of the Trinity he made, or the, the, the um, painting. Three people sitting at a table eating and discussing things. Talking about family. Talking about a love relationship. Okay? The Bible says, Dear God, I am powerless and I have no place to hide. My life has no meaning without your love to guide. I come to you today because I believe you can renew and restore me to the place that I once had.
from just outside our nation's capital, from Abiding Life Grace and Faith Center in Alexandria, Virginia, I'm Ken Miller. You can get information about this ministry at abidinglife.net or rolw.org. Feel free to send me an email, pastor at abidinglife.net or ken at rolw.org. Join us any Sunday morning at 11 o'clock or Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Our meeting location is at 1001 Queen Street in Alexandria. Our mailing address is Post Office Box 772, Annandale, Virginia 22003. God bless you.